My name is Ethan Green. I'm currently the director of the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, and I also work with uh, Colorado Mountain College in uh, Avalanche Science uh, program that they uh, present to train Avalanche workers. Um, my background is a bit academic and a bit operational. I've sort of gone between the two over the the many years now that I've been doing this, um, and the. Research that I did, at least in academia, was mostly around atmospheric modeling and modeling snow drifts, and then looking at uh, heat and mass transfer in snow and its effects on snow microstructure. Around 26 people die in avalanches each year in the United States, and that changes, um, of course, from, from year to year. Some of the more deadly seasons that we've seen, at least in modern history, have been in the last few years. Um, but if you look at the long-term record, they still don't compare to some of the years that we saw in the late 1800s and early 1900s when avalanches were impacting industrial sites and occupied structures. Most of the fatalities now are recreational, and um, so they're still very serious accidents, but we don't see the really large numbers of people involved in one avalanche today like we did uh, back in the late 1800s. Most of the deaths and injuries we see today are in a recreational setting. So people that are mostly in the backcountry, so the vast mountainous areas of the United States, and participating in their own recreation. So not part of a ski area or an organized group or a place that has um, a robust uh, safety program. So it really has a lot to do with education, of training people how to take the information that's available and apply that in the backcountry in their own setting to keep themselves out of harm's way. Um, so we can do a lot with education, we can do a lot with equipment, uh, and we can do a lot with increasing the availability uh, of forecasts. But when it comes down to it, we really need to be in the backcountry with people when they're making kind of small decisions about where they're gonna go. And that's a pretty difficult task to accomplish. What people can do to avoid getting caught in an avalanche is um, think about avalanches when they're making plans for their recreational day and continue to think about them as they're moving through the terrain throughout the day. With avalanches, sometimes very small changes in where people go can make a really big difference. So getting current information, checking the forecast, so they know what the current conditions are, looking at where they're gonna go and what they wanna do for the day, and thinking about how that interfaces with the avalanche conditions, and making a good plan and then sticking to that plan throughout the day so that they don't uh, see deep powder snow that looks attractive and lose track of all the good planning that they did uh, earlier in the day or the day before. The next thing that they can do is be prepared for an accident. So uh, staying out of avalanches is your best approach. But if something goes wrong, uh, the people in your group are going to need to perform a rescue. And so having avalanche rescue equipment, an avalanche rescue transceiver, a pro pole, and a shovel, everybody in the group needs to carry that equipment, and they also need to know how to use it. What we do know is a bit more uh, about the snow, and it's been uh, a very dry year across the Western US. We have a below normal snowpack in almost every place. Um, and we have a fairly weak snowpack uh, because we have fairly shallow snow. That's changed a little bit over the last month. 
Um, it's become a little bit more complicated, a little bit more diverse. Uh, but that same message, I think, still holds across um, the vast Western U.S. The forecasts that are done on avalanches really focus on a short time period. We're really forecasting for a few hours or a few days at the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, we do weekly outlooks, uh, but we don't put out forecasts longer than seven days. So that's really where we have the most skill and where we feel like we can make the most impact. And that time scale is really different than what you would look at for uh, say a climate uh, forecast or from a climate perspective. That really depends on what you consider as accurate. Uh, right now, we're not able to tell you exactly when. So on the, the scale of, uh, of minutes or maybe even hours or the exact size. So maybe the portion of a slope um, that's gonna avalanche. But what we can do is talk about the trends of uh, avalanches where they're going to happen, the types of terrain in terms of aspect, elevation, slope, angle, location. Uh, we can do that uh, fairly well. Uh, our forecasts are for vast parts of Colorado. Uh, we look at the accuracy uh, around 85% uh, at this point. What we can do if for specific locations is uh, make forecasts and then test those forecasts by trying to set off avalanches. And that's what we do for transportation corridors. It's what ski areas do for their slopes is track the avalanche potential, make predictions about um, how and where avalanches are gonna release and then move uh, anything that we care about, mostly people, out of harm's way and test that hypothesis by trying to set off avalanches, typically with explosives. And again, um, that is more of a hypothesis testing sort of approach, um, but it proves to be quite effective uh, in reducing the avalanche risk uh, to elements that uh, elements that are exposed to avalanche hazard. Well, there's lots of different types of avalanches. The ones that are most deadly are called slab avalanches, where a large cohesive piece of snow breaks off the hillside and rolls down into the valley. Those avalanches typically uh, break at the interfaces between layers that form in the snowpack. Those layers form through successive weather events. So any big snowstorm, uh, wind drifting event, or a calm period where we have no precipitation and maybe clear skies uh, day after day, those will all form layers in the snowpack. And the interactions of those layers is what produces the avalanche potential. So a lot of what avalanche forecasters do is identify the formation of these layers, uh, when they're forming and over what areas they're forming, and then track the mechanical properties of those layers uh, through time. 